Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Emily Friedman, uh, and this semester in my Games as Stories course, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so for the students that will be in quarantine or out for whatever reason, I'm recording what I'm calling the campaign diaries, um, the class recaps of discussion. It's no substitute for being with us and playing with us and discussing these ideas in the day to day, but for those who can't be there, it's a, as good as we're gonna get. It's also the added bonus of I'm putting these up available on YouTube for folks who are interested in knowing how this class goes. Um, that includes some really interesting streamers and game devs who uh, we're gonna be studying and being in conversation with. Um, in different kinds of ways. So how do you start a class about games? Well, when registration ended uh, months ago now, uh, the course had filled within hours. So I knew that almost all of our students are seniors, which meant that I could get a little bit ambitious. I also knew that uh, this class draws from uh, students who are in many different majors across many different colleges. Um, not all are English majors, uh, not all are in the College of Liberal Arts. This course fulfills a requirement for English education, among other things. So we've got a kind of amazing one-room schoolhouse, including about a third of the class who are somehow connected to the world of tabletop role-playing already, uh, either through our Auburn University Club or through their own gameplay. So we've got a lot of mixed experiences and they kind of run the gamut. Did an initial kind of temperature check of anxiety levels and they went from no concern to high concern. Um, and when we talked about that today, it became clear that one of the anxiety levels for the people who are totally new is, what is a role-playing game? Luckily, that was my goal for what we were gonna talk about today is kind of the initial discussion of how do we define role-playing games? So what was available on the tables in our active learning classroom, which is built around kind of shared tables, were the following objects from the professor's own collection. Dungeons and Dimes Scurry, uh, a brand new role-playing game. I can still smell the scented candles that uh, come as part of it. Um, the Deep Dark, a role-playing game um, for Dungeon Adventures. Um, Thousand-Year-Old Vampire! Um, the incredibly beautiful solo RPG um, that uh, we will be dipping into a little bit in a couple of weeks. Uh, Good Society, uh, the Kickstarter phenomenon and Austin Nerd Extravaganza, which um, there's a whole table of Austin fans who I heard saying, this is like Bridgerton, very excitedly. This was also the table with the m least experience with tabletop role-playing games, but they jumped on this one immediately. Um, but there were also some kind of flashes from the past, um, from my own gaming experience. Like, so welcome to the 90s, y'all. Uh, this is the game I played most in, uh, in high school. Uh, so shout out to those uh, who played along with me. Um, in Nomine by Steve Jackson Games, which came in angel version as well as a demonic version in terms of its kind of uh, visuals. Um, but inside is, uh, is very familiar to kind of anybody who kind of explored various gritty kinds of RPGs uh, in the 90s. Um, we also had on the table Tune, the game that I have also had since the, night, since the 90s from Steve Jackson. That you can see the binding is still pretty perfect because I can never convince anyone to play it. Will this be the semester that I convince someone to play Tune? Stay tuned. And of course, it uh, wouldn't be the first day of class in a trip down 1990s RPG memory lane if we didn't have a copy of Vampire the Masquerade. Um, with an additional changeling, because that's how we roll in this house. Um, which led me to give a little bit of a digression about um, what LARPing was like in the 1990s before we had things like safety tools, which is also something that we talked about in class today. We'll have more of a discussion about safety tools on Thursday, um, 
because we're going to be playing for the queen, um, which has famously the X card. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about other systems of ensuring player safety and table um, standards. Um, but we started talking about that today as we looked at all of these games, including um, our beautiful, incredibly lovely outlier amending, which of course um, students immediately wanted to get their hands on because it has all of these lovely components um, and interactivity. And of course you sew it, um, which is really fantastic. Um, so what do all of these things have in common? Well, storytelling is clearly the case. Um, and uh, the idea that we are using our imaginations, that we're meeting the work halfway. We're not being given a narrative uh, to play with. We are instead creating the narrative. And in fact, every time we play, it's different uh, because we're different people. You never step in the same stream twice. We discussed length. Some of these games are designed to be played for a long time and some of them not so long. Um, we also discussed the way that mechanics play into this, right? These are not just us sitting around telling a story. In some way, shape, or form, these all have some kind of rule or mechanism, be it cards or dice or turning the page, that means that there's an element of chance, that it's not, we're not alone making the story. We are instead making it together with these kinds of elements of chance, of, uh, you know, letting the dice tell the story. Uh, in many kinds of ways. So then we kind of uh, moved to uh, a little bit of a discussion of who I am and why am I doing this. Um, and so it's important to know that I'm an 18th century scholar, um, but that I spent the pandemic, as you can know from seeing other stuff on this channel, working with Emily Kugler at Howard, playing games inspired by the 18th century, but also trying to think about the narratology of games, um, both in terms of games that we play, but also now with the rise of streaming culture, the games that we watch in different kinds of formats. And that's when I dropped the critical role bomb, right? The, the Mac daddy, the biggest, the longest, the most ambitious in, in many ways of the actual plays, um, which takes 500 hours to get through one campaign. Um, and of course, pushing a thousand uh, to kind of ingest the whole. Um, and as I've told students, I've written um, academic work uh, and I'm thinking about public writing that tries to understand what the appeal of this is, not only to understand an abstract notion of what a critter is, but also to understand why I've invested this time and what pleasure I'm taking from it. Uh, more on that next week when we talk about my actual academic work. But that was when we discovered that there are several critters in the room, um, which is fantastic and fabulous. Um, at the end of class, one student said, hey, in this class, you could say, is it Thursday yet? I'm not Matt Mercer, but wouldn't the world be nicer if more of us were like him? I mean, performatively, sure. So I think it was a really good initial conversation. By, by the time we'd explored these objects and, and taken a look at them and, and shared them with each other um, across the classroom, I think we had a, a kind of good starting understanding of what it is we're kind of thinking about. And that was when I kind of moved to also adding in the idea of the big three questions. What is a game about? How is the game about that? And what behaviors does a game incentivize in its players? That's one version of, of, of the big three uh, questions. And we used a interesting case study, um, which is to say we used two rooms and a boom uh, to think about this. So we played this. If you are playing along with us at home, you can either play this yourself if you've got a big group of masked, socially distanced people, or you can watch um, you can watch uh, Shut Up and Sit Downs uh, before times recording of a um, convention version of the game. And so we talked about this about, you know, in the ways in which asking the question of, is this a role playing game? You are playing roles, right? You are handed a card of, you know, your role, what team you're on, um, but it takes very little time to play. Um, the first round is three minutes, the second round is two minutes, and the first, last round is one. 
And you can play it re multiple times iteratively. And we didn't. We just played one set of rounds. Um, we played the simplest possible version. But as we discussed in the kind of breakdown after, you know, it's not an intense role playing game, but it is a game where you can start to tell a story and that story might look different and that gameplay might look different if we played this again at the end of the semester, once we all know each other. Because some pockets of this class know each other quite well, but most of us are new to each other. Um, so we haven't yet learned kind of our tells. We haven't figured out exactly how to push people's buttons. Well, hopefully we'll use those skills uh, as we get to know each other for good and not evil. Um, but alignment's probably also a discussion for a different day. But so we discussed, what is this game about? Um, terrorism um, is part of it. Social deduction is another part that came up. Um, but also thinking about, you know, how to, you know, this as a kind of a um, ecosystem of you know, political actors in different kinds of ways. And the more sophisticated roles that come in the more advanced version of the game, which is also included in here, my thanks to students for being very patient with the fact that the cards were a, hot, a little bit of a hot mess. Um, and that the game uh, kind of very short window of play adds to the meaning and understanding of what the game is about. Um, so that the how um, is, is, is working in that way, as well as in the kind of fact that people have to talk to each other, have to kind of negotiate, uh, have to try to read each other in different sorts of ways. And so then when we talk, talked about what behaviors does the game incentivize, it incentivizes the ability to uh, talk to each other, um, to manipulate people is what one student said. Um, I said to lie. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll see. I mean, that that's a debatable term. And I think a lot of what we're going to be talking about this semester is in the realm of debate um, and discussion. And that's because this class is a little bit of a choose your own adventure. So I've said that the course is divided into three parts. Um, this first part that we're going to be doing for the first five weeks is what I'm calling the lore dump. We have, because we have so many students who have so many different kinds of experiences or lack thereof with role-playing games, we need to all get on the same page. And we're also coming from lots of different disciplines. So even the people who have backgrounds in tabletop role-playing games, we've played different systems, we've played them different generationally, and we look at them in different kinds of ways. So the goal for the first weeks is to get us on the same page by having us play some games that we can now add to our shared vocabulary. Um, read some game criticism of different kinds, uh, different ways that people in and out of academia write about games for each other, um, including my own attempts to write to academia, but also to audiences outside of academia. Um, next week, we're going to talk to my good friend uh, Tiffany Lee about their work as a reviewer of, game, of tabletop games, um, which I'm hoping is going to spur them. Along the way, students will have contracted, um, made a, an agreement with me about what their plan is for what grade they want and what they're going to do to to earn that grade. And that can include reviews of, of actual play streams and podcasts, um, reviews of games that they play test themselves, as well as more traditional uh pre or outlines of academic articles, as well as tests of creative making that they do themselves. Uh, if they want to write their own adventures, they want to write a computer RPG, they're, they've got the time and space to do that. In week five, we're going to do some of that exploration together, and we're going to decide as a class what the next five weeks or so of readings will be. Um, that could go a lot of different ways depending on the kind of will of the class. We could do a deep dive into one of these more complex games and play it as a class. Um, we could watch a you know intensive stream and do some close reading of a bunch of episodes. We could do comparative work, right? Like looking at a bunch of different play styles of Call of Cthulhu, uh, for example. We could try to build some stuff. We desperately need a streaming database, kind of like the International Movie Database, but we don't have one. We don't have a network analysis of streamers to see how they are and aren't connected, or as I like to call it, six degrees of B-Dave. Um, 
we could make that or we could start making that as part of this class. So we're gonna talk about that at the end of week five, beginning of week six, and then I'm gonna build out the next part of the syllabus based on those kinds of student feedback. This is very much what I normally do at the end of a semester where I ask students about what they, whether they want more, less, or different of texts we encountered so that when I teach the class the next time, it's been transformed uh, by the feedback from real students who have experienced uh, what I've been teaching. So at the end, weeks 11 through 15, I'm calling hat tip to Matthew Mercer. How do you want to do this? And that's where we're going to go into completely lab space. Um, students will be in our active learning classroom together. Some of them will be working in groups. Some of them will be working by themselves. All of them will be working with me alongside them as a coach and encourager. We'll do some days of workshopping of different people's projects. But by then, the idea is students are going to go make something. Um, using Ryan Cordell's idea of the un-essay, which is to kind of break free of the traditional essay form, which doesn't serve everyone. Um, we're instead going to be tasking each other with acts of making. Some of those may be textual, some of those may be programming, some of those may be visual, some of those may be some combination. Um, and I'll link uh, in the notes to uh, Ryan Cordell's version of this. Uh, students will do one or two un-essays across the semester. If they want an A, they'll do two. If they just want to get through the class, well, they can just do one that's due at the end of the semester. My goals for the class, as I told my students, are first and foremost, get all of us out of here alive, happy, and healthy. Second of all, to give a space while the world is literally and figuratively on fire to play and to think about joy seriously. I take this class seriously. Uh, I'm going to hold students to their contracts, but I also wanted to have a certain amount of mercy, flexibility, and creativity, which often can elude us in formal higher ed. But why does it? So those are my pedagogical goals at this moment in time. Uh, is to create a space where we're all thinking about this stuff seriously um, for some folks for the first time ever. Um, because I think that role-playing games, whether you're playing them by yourself on a computer or playing them around a table with your friends or uh, some hybrid of the two, are a genre and a mode that have that have a long history of influencing the rest of our culture the example of course that's trotted out is that tolkien may have inspired dungeons and dragons in some very real way but dungeons and dragons then inspired an enormous amount of our culture as well and continues to do so and of course there's lots of stuff beyond the dungeon uh, and a lot of cutting edge and exciting games and ways of thinking about play and storytelling that then will potentially, you know, answer some questions that mass media hasn't yet wrestled with adequately. The example I gave in class was the Bridgerton problem, the problem that Trisha Matthew talks about in terms of representation and how Bridgerton gets it all, gets, it's hard to know how to get race right when you're dealing with the Regency, but Bridgerton certainly has its challenges of colorism and, and other kinds of leaning, falling back on, on tropes. You can see uh, Emily Kugler and my discussion of that uh, elsewhere on our channel here. What's fascinating that Dr. Kugler and I have discovered while we've been spending the pandemic playing games inspired by the 18th century is that that problem has already been tackled not necessarily successfully answered, but grappled with for years and years by indie games that are also setting, trying to figure out how to make Austin a bigger tent, more representative, um, more queer, more brown, more lots of, more trans, more lots of things, right? Um, and so, but of course, these are discourses that don't necessarily come together uh, all the time. So that's the space that we're working in this semester. That's where we are. Um, for my students, I hope if you have questions that, you know, we'll 
have that conversation when I see you next. And of course, you can find me on the Discord or email or on Canvas. Um, I'm here for you. Um, for anyone who's watching this who is not in my class, I'm glad you're here. I hope this is interesting and useful. Um, this is what you're gonna get is just me rambling while I'm still high on the fact that my students are awesome and this class is fun. And even though every so many things are around right now are hard, this, this is less hard. Um, if you have questions, feel free uh, to tweet me at uh, Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E, -E, um, and uh, or drop a comment below. Um, and uh, I'm interested to see what you think. Um, so more on Thursday. I'm not going to say is it Thursday yet, um, but more on Thursday. See you then.